praise the Lord. Hey, let's keep clapping this morning. Come on, the Bible says to praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, to praise him in his mighty heaven, to praise him for his acts of power, to praise him for his surpassing greatness, to praise him with the sounding of the trumpets, come on church, to praise him with the harp and the lyre, the tambourine and the dance, the string and the flutes, hey, to praise him with the clash of the cymbals, the resounding cymbals, come on church, if you're breathing this morning, the Bible declared that we ought to be praising the Lord, come on, the Bible declared that we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Hey, we are a holy nation. A peculiar people. I don't know about you, but God's called me out of darkness. Come on. Has there anybody been called out of darkness this morning? Well, the Bible declares that we've been called into his marvelous light. And if I can't get excited about anything else, I can get excited about what the Lord's done in my life. Amen. Praise the Lord. Woo. You may be seated. Now, we are the next generation power force. Everybody say the next generation. And I can see a lot of people looking at me saying, what in the world has pastor gone and gotten more security? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're not security, but you know what? Hey, let's give it up for this pastor and his wife for having a vision to reach their community. How many of you know this is a great pastor? He has a heart for the people. How many of you know that? Amen? Praise the Lord. And you know what? Let's give it up for the praise and worship team also. Praise the Lord. They're great. Let me tell you, I can't sing. As a matter of fact, Pastor, when they were singing, I was trying to stop. I didn't want to interrupt Matt, and I, I tried to talk, sing really lowly because I can't sing. I can't dance. But how many of you understand I found something I can do for God? Amen. How many of you understand when God made you, he didn't make anybody else like you? How many of you know nobody else has your fingerprint, your toe print? Nobody can make the same difference you can make. Come on, how many of you know nobody can reach the same people? How many of you know when we use our gifts and talents for God, how many of you think God called that great? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we're the next generation power force, and I want to tell you, uh, my name is Jerome King, and I'm from West Monroe, Louisiana, uh, the home of Duck Dynasty. How many of you guys? Hey, I'm, we graduated with those guys, went to school with them. Uh, it's a very small town, a lot smaller than Evansville, and I want to tell you, everybody in that town is happy, happy, happy. Amen? Yeah. But I want to tell you, how many of you think today is not a happy place for the devil? Amen? Come on, how many of you believe that? And you know what, Pastor? I've been on John's team for 12 years now, and John Jacobs who started strength evangelism right here in Evansville. And tonight, I want to encourage you to come out to Abundant Life Church. And you know what? How many of you think we're believing for a great move of God tonight? So come out tonight at 6 o'clock. And I got to tell you, I've been doing this for almost 12 years, working with John Jacobs and the strength team going into the schools. But I've never seen what we've been seeing for the past two years. Hey, every single week, God has been opening all of heavens to our meeting and we've been seeing the devil's generals change sides amen you know what ladies and gentlemen not too long ago we had a city manager a mayor a police chief and a federal judge got saved we were at a church the other day and the pastor had been the pastor there for 20 years and his 88 year old father came forward and got born again now how many of you understand god's given us a tool to be able to reach people who wouldn't normally come to church amen and I want to tell you, tonight's going to be a bad night for the devil. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen, I'll, I'll, before I introduce one of the guys who've come with me, because we have five members of our team, uh, one of the world's strongest men who pulled a 737 jet airplane who holds the world record in the deadlift, 800 pounds, over 21 reps. We have another guy who was an American gladiator. Uh, he was originally met golden by the name of Thor, and he did the giant uh, joust or Q-tips, what we call them. And we have another guy who played seven years in the NFL, four with the Carolina Panthers, and three with Peyton Manning and the Indianapolis Colts. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to encourage you to come out tonight at 6 o'clock at Abundant Life Church. We're going to be doing some amazing feats of strength. We're going to be tearing stuff up. Uh, we're going to be breaking things. But how many of you understand God's given us a tool to be able to reach people who wouldn't normally come to church? You know what? 67% of the world watches wrestling, and we're just cashing in on something that the world thinks is cool. Amen? So we want to encourage you to come out tonight. But ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to tell you what's recently been happening in our meetings. Uh, I, like I told you, a federal judge came forward. But uh, a guy came forward the other day, and this shocked us. And the guy's hair was wild, and his shirt read something that you can't even say in church. And you know what? God spoke to John Jacob, the founder of this strength evangelism team. 
go down there and talk to him and be his friend. Because how many of you understand Jesus was the friend of sinners? Amen. How many of you know God didn't come to hurt you? God came to help you. And you know what John, you know what the God tells John with tears in his eyes as he's standing down there really getting saved? He said that he's robbed two banks. He was a modern day bank robber and it shocked John. So you know what John tells the guy who's standing there getting saved? He said, well, that's great. If you'll invite every criminal that you know tomorrow night, I'll break handcuffs just for you in your honor. And ladies and gentlemen, you'll never guess who that guy walked through those church doors with. Over 19 men. And you know who they were? The leading crystal meth dealers and the leading crime figures in that county. And at the very end of the service, all 19 of them came forward, got born again, saved and set free and wait the sheriff called us two weeks later and you know what the sheriff said your meeting changed the atmosphere of the county now how many of you understand tonight we don't just need another church service how many of you know we don't need just another get together but how many of you think we need a god happening that changes something in the atmosphere of the spirit come on how many of you believe that this morning and i want to tell you I told that same story not too long ago in Atlanta, Georgia, and guess who was sitting in the crowd? A sheriff. And the sheriff got so motivated the next night, you know what he did? He brought the whole jail with him, over 37 prisoners and 19 deputies, and at the very end of the service, we had 30 prisoners and 11 deputies gave their heart to Jesus. Now, how many of you think we need a good shaking up for God? Come on. So I want to encourage you to come out tonight at 6 o'clock. We're going to tear things up. We're going to have a great time. But most of all, I'm, coming, I'm calling in runaway dads. I'm calling in kids that are lost. How many of you understand God's given us the tool to be able to reach people who would normally come to church? Amen. And ladies and gentlemen, this morning, I did not come along. And as a matter of fact, ladies and gentlemen, here's a man who's been doing strength evangelism over 10 years. Ladies and gentlemen, everywhere he goes in the world, he shares about the love of God. One of the strongest men to ever come out of the state of Kansas. Ladies and gentlemen, he's one of the only men able to snap two baseball bats over 800 pounds of pressure behind his back. Ladies and gentlemen, able to leg press over 1,000 pounds, plays semi-pro football, stands 5'11", weighs 330 pounds, all the way from St. Louis, Missouri. Give it up for Matthew Stout. Come on out, Matt. <laughs> Woo. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to give you a small taste of what we're going to be doing tonight. Tonight, you're going to see a man attempt to snap out of a pair of police-issued handcuffs. You're going to see a guy bite and chew through two, two Indiana license plates, steel license plates. Tonight, John Jacobs himself, who started this strength evangelism team right here in Evansville, Indiana, over 30 years ago, went to Bethel Temple High School. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you tonight, we're believing for a mighty move of God. Come on, how many of you know, how many of you think this is going to be the worst night in the history of Evansville, Indiana, for the devil? Come on, how many of you believe that tonight? Come on. And ladies and gentlemen, I have here, if you've ever seen John before, uh, John started this almost 40 years ago and ladies and gentlemen what they're known for is taking telephone books ripping them down the middle like one sheet of paper and now as time has grown and we've gotten into technology across America uh, phone books are getting harder to find pastor as a matter of fact this is all I could find this morning but I'm not just gonna rip this with my hands I missed breakfast this morning. So I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm gonna place this telephone book in my teeth and just using my teeth in my hand, I'm gonna attempt to bite and chew through a telephone book for you guys. And then, ladies and gentlemen, every morning I get an opportunity to come to church with my Bible and a frying pan. And I can look at some of the people saying, what in the world is he gonna do with this perfectly good frying pan from Target? Or some of you guys may call it Target. But what you're gonna see one of us attempt to do today, just using our hands, we're gonna attempt to roll this frying pan up until it looks like an Evansville burrito for you guys. And then, ladies and gentlemen, Matthew Stout, one of the strongest men to ever live in the state of Kansas. We're known for taking baseball bats, and if you, we, we could take a baseball bat and snap it over our leg, no problem. But ladies and gentlemen, you won't see this too often. What I've asked Matt Stout to do this morning is not just place this bat over his leg, but he's going to place it over his head without a towel, and just using his arms, he's going to attempt to snap and explode a baseball bat over his head for you guys. And then, ladies and gentlemen, 
Do we have another one? He's going to snap one behind his back. But how many of you understand the reason we do these things is so that you'll invite your friend, your neighbor who doesn't know God. Come on, how many of you know God's given us a tool to be able to reach people who wouldn't normally come to church? And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? Before we attempt to snap these baseball bats and, and roll up frying pans, I've asked Matt to share his favorite scripture for you guys. You know, uh, no one story is greater than the other. How many of you know the greatest story of all is the day you call on Jesus to come to live inside your heart? And the Bible says that the evil one is defeated by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And I've asked Matt to just share one scripture for you guys really quick. And then we're going to get right into the feats of strength. We're going to have fun. But how many, of you, how many of you guys want to hear Matt's story? Let's give it up for Matt Stout. How you guys doing? What a week, huh? How many of you guys got to see the eclipse? Did you guys see that? You can't tell me that there's not a God. But how many of you guys want to know what the secret is to changing the atmosphere in your area, in your circle? See, my first Bible verse I ever memorized in, in Sunday school was Matthew 5, 16. It says, let your light so shine before men that they can see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. How many of you guys know that that total eclipse that we had this week showed our Father's good works? I mean, it glorified him. You can't tell me there's not a God. See, St. Francis of Assisi said, preach Jesus everywhere you go using only words if necessary. If you guys want, you guys want to impact your generation and the generation behind you, you got to let your light shine. Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men. And that's what we do up here on stage. We're not up here to impress you by breaking stuff and ripping phone books. We're up here to bring a message. And that one message is, do you know Jesus? Because if you don't know Jesus, hell is too long to be wrong. So if you don't know Jesus, at the end of this program, I promise you, you're going to have a chance to meet him. You're going to have a chance to receive him. And if you haven't done that yet, that's why this whole meeting is designed for you today, is so you can say yes to Jesus. Give it up for Matt Stout, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Matthew Stout is going to attempt to snap a baseball bat over his head, over 400 pounds of pressure. Come on, Oak Hill Christian Church Center, let's get behind Matthew David Stout as he attempts to break this baseball bat over his head. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, somebody help him out. Come on. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, Matthew David Stout. Come on, church. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, he's having a hard time. He's going to probably break it over his legs. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, give it a, get behind him. Come on. Well, my life was Come on, church. He's going to attempt it. He's going to give it one more attempt. No Let me put it down. Matthew, out, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, somebody help him out. Come on, church. He's going to attempt to snap it over his leg, ladies and gentlemen. This is a tough baseball bat. Over 400 pounds of pressure. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. Somebody help him. Oh, give it up for Matthew Stout. Somebody get behind Big Jerome King. Say, go, Jerome, go. Say, go, Jerome, go. Let me hear you. Somebody holler. Somebody scream. Come on, get behind Big Jerome. Say, go, Jerome, go. Shake like a chair. Maybe he came to you when everything seemed fine. Or maybe your world was upside down and you were between me. Somebody say, Go, Jerome, go. Stand to your feet. Let's get behind him. Chew, chew, chew. All right, that wasn't a very good phone book you're reading. But, ladies and gentlemen, Matthew Stout's going to attempt. To snap a baseball bat behind his back. Come on, church. Let's get behind Matthew Stout. Come on, church. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. Somebody help him out. Woo! Praise the Lord. Hey, let's give it up for Matthew Stout. Praise the Lord. Are we having a good time in the house of the Lord? Hey, we, we believe if there was a revision, it'd be thou shalt not bore in church. But before I send uh, Matt back to his schools, I want you, I mean, to his seat, I want you to be praying for us this year. Uh, this year, 
John's strength team will be in hundreds of schools speaking a message of hope into the young kids' hearts. And I want you to understand something. Ministers aren't allowed to go into the school. But how many of you think it's a great deal that God's made a way for us to be able to go where preachers can't go and impart a message of hope into the young kid's heart? And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? It's not because we're great speakers, but we go in there and we press along. We snap a baseball bat. And how many of you understand we get their attention? And we believe that if you can get a young person's attention, you can put a message of hope into their heart. And ladies and gentlemen, we were in the largest high school in Alabama last year, a school of 4,000 young people. And as we were speaking under the anointing of God, because how many of you understand, although we're great speakers, but how many of you know it's the anointing that changes things? Amen? How many of you know it's the anointing? And as we were speaking under the anointing of God, kids started standing up. A girl said, I'm not going to do drugs anymore. And it sent a molecular reaction through the crowd. And kids started standing up. I'm not going to use people. I'm not going to get drunk anymore. And the principal was a Jehovah's Witness. He was flipped out. So you know what he said? I'm going to cancel classes for the rest of the afternoon. And whoever wants to go to the auditorium and talk to the power force, you can go right ahead. We prayed with and talked to over 500 public school kids and invited all of them back to the church that night, including the Jehovah's Witness principal, and all of them came forward and got born again, including the principal. In the past two years, we saw over 17 principals give their heart to Jesus. Now, how many of you understand God's given us a tool to be able to reach people who wouldn't normally come to church? So I encourage you, uh, I encourage you tonight, uh, come out tonight at 6 o'clock. We're going to tear things up. Uh, but you know what, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we, I'm going to leave you with this. We sing about heaven. We talk about heaven. How many of you understand we can't wait to get to heaven? But how many of you know when we get to heaven, there's not going to be one more person to win for Jesus? Can anybody hear me this morning? When we get to heaven, there's not going to be one more person to pull out of the ditch. Not going to be one more person to make a difference in their life. How many of you understand this is our moment to make a difference for God? The Bible declared that we've been born for such a time as this, and that's to make a difference for God. Amen? So I want to encourage you to come out tonight at 6 o'clock and uh, invite somebody out. Uh, get on Facebook or Twitter. And you know what? I'm calling in runaway dads. We're calling in kids that are lost. We're believing that wives get new Christian husbands, new kids get new Christian daddies. How many of you understand God's giving us a tool? Amen? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Well, Matt, you may be seated. Praise the Lord. Well, we're about to get into the Word of God. Pastor told me I only have three hours, so I better hurry up. Nah. Well, I can look at a lot of people saying, there's no way in the world I'm going to sit here for three hours. No. But you know what? We're coming down to the last few minutes, uh, but we're about to get right into the Word of God. How many of you are excited about the Word of God? Amen? Praise the Lord. Well, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to share one scripture from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. It's in the very back of the Bible, a couple of books before Revelation. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. I want you to write this scripture down. I want you to inscript it in your brain. You know, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? We need to be speaking the word of God. Line it up with the word. You know what I found out? I found out that Sundays with Joel Osteen won't change your life. Wednesdays with T.D. Jakes won't change your life. Fridays with Charles Stanley won't change your life. But you know what will change your life? The Word of God. The Word of God will change your life. You know how I know? Because it changed my life. And we need to be speaking the Word of God. Line it up with the Word. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 that the Word of God is quick, is powerful, is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, the joints and marrow. Come on, this stuff gets down into your joints and marrow. Come on, somebody say that's deep. It's a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. You see, the Word of God will change your life. And I know that because it changed my life. And I'm going to share one scripture from the Bible in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and always be ready to give a defense, or some Bible said the answer, to everyone who asks you for the reason of the hope that is in you with meanness and fear. I'll say it one more time. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart. And to always be ready to give an answer for the reason of the hope that is in you 
with meekness and fear. Let us pray over this word. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this priceless opportunity that you've given me. Father, I pray for every person in this building that they would open up their heart to receive your word. Father, today I pray that your word has transforming power. Lord, I know that you said to not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may prove what is good, what is acceptable, and what is a perfect will of God. Father, I pray for your anointing up in this place. Plow up the fallow grounds. Lord, I know that the flower is going to fade the grass is going to wither but the word of the Lord shall endure forever Lord let your word speak to every person here let us not leave here the same in Jesus name 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15 says but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and the word sanctify means to acknowledge or to set apart time for the Lord God in your heart not just on Sunday not just on Wednesday night prayer meeting not just on Friday night youth group but each and every day we should set apart time for the Lord in our heart you see God wants a relationship with us each and every day but that's not the part of the verse that I want to focus on this morning because it goes on to say and to always be ready everybody say be ready to give in a defense or some Bible say an answer for the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear you see this morning what I want to focus on is hope you see I believe that a lot of people not just in church but in general struggle with hope you know why I believe that because the Bible declares that hope deferred makes the heart sick how many of you out here have ever put your hope into this world and been let down I'm sure every person in this building has put your hope into this world and you have been let down but I want to tell you why there's hope in me although you did not ask me this morning you see if you're a believer in this building there has to be something different about you and people want to know what it is you see, we do hundreds of school assemblies each and every year, from Bangor, Maine to Kodiak Island, Alaska, all across the United States, elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools. And when we go into an elementary school, first through fifth grade, one of, the favorite, one of our favorite questions is, do you have a hope? What's your dream? And in an elementary school, you will see 100% of the elementary students' hands that go up. I mean, literally, a kid will coach you out of the building if you don't pick them so they can tell you what they want to be when they get a little bit older. But as we make our way to middle schools and junior highs, all across the United States, north, south, east, and west, and we ask the young middle school students, do you have a hope? What's your dream? You'll be lucky if 60% of the middle school students raise their hand all across the nation. And as we make our way to high schools, north, south, east, and west, and we ask the young adults, do you have a hope? What's your dream? You'll be lucky if 30% of the high school students raise their hand. And you know what that tells us, ladies and gentlemen? That tells us that somewhere in between elementary school and high school, kids today are struggling with hope. Come on, how many of you believe that? All you have to do is turn on your television or read your newspaper. One of the leading secular bands that came out, you know what the name of the album was called? All Hope Is Gone. That's the message that's being sent to the kids today. All hope is gone. But I'm here today to tell you that all hope is not gone. Because my Bible declares in 1 John chapter 4 verse 4 that you are of God's little children and have overcome the world because greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. I say greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. You know we ask the young kids, what do you want to be with your life? I want to be the next major league baseball player. I want to be the next NFL superstar. I want to be the next WWE wrestler. But come to find out, not too long ago, one of the top wrestlers, he had it going on. He had all the money, a beautiful wife, a beautiful son, a beautiful house on the hill. In the world's estimation, he had it going on. But come to find out, he choked his wife and he killed her. Then he choked his son and he killed him. And then he hung himself. You know what, for the life of me, Pastor, I can't find any hope in that situation. You know, not too long ago, there was some teenagers sitting on the side of a lake as a young man stayed in there and he was drowning, out, he was drowning, crying out for help. And as they stood there, they were laughing and they didn't even show any emotion. And guess what? I can't find any hope in that situation either. But I want to tell you why there's hope in me. Although you did not ask me this morning. You see, if you're a believer in this building, there has to be something different about you. And people want to know what it is. You see, I grew up with big hopes and big dreams in a town called West Monroe, Louisiana. You know, it was a town that struggled with hope. 
It was a town that was very divided. All of our heroes were on TV, they seemed so far away. You know, I grew up in a home of four, me, my brother, my dad, and my mom. You know, I was the only kid in my neighborhood that had both my mom and dad at home. Everybody thought my house was the place to be. But little did they know my dad was an alcoholic. You know, I used to watch my dad beat on my mom. He used to beat on me and my brother. I'd hear pictures being knocked off the wall. I'd hear dishes being broken. I remember hearing my mom scream for her life as I was locked outside the door and I punched through the window in the fourth grade and I nearly cut my hand off and I still carry that scar with me today. So as a kid, I looked for love in all the wrong places. I looked for love in all the wrong areas. I grew up in a neighborhood that struggled with hope. The only people we had to look up to were guys with the big fancy cars and the pocket full of money. And you know what those guys told me my whole life? They told us that if you can get your hands on some money, you can live in a place where you don't have to worry no more. If you could just get your hands on some money, you can live in a place where there's peace and happiness, no more pain. And I never had any money before, so I held on to those words. I believed in them. My mom, she was the only Christian in our home. You see, my mom took me to church every Sunday. I was on the worship team. I was on the usher board. I knew all the stories of the Bible. I knew how to pray for people. I even knew how to cry. But how many of you understand, going to church doesn't make you a Christian anymore than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. God wants a relationship with you. And I didn't have a relationship with God. You see, my brother made it to the NFL when I was 15 years old. Man, here it is. We have all the money. We have everything this world says it takes for you to be successful. We thought, why do we need God? But you know what? After playing in the NFL, I realized something. Jerome King could never be strong enough. You know, I went to college for six years working on a master's and I realized that I could never be smart enough. There came a point in my life where I had to surrender my life to an almighty God and ask God to come and live inside my heart and save me. And I saw my dad give his life to the Lord. You see, I saw my dad say, hey, I'll stop drinking and then I'll come to church or I'll stop doing this and then I'll go. But how many of you understand it doesn't work like that? You have to give your problem to God and then when God owns you, God will clean you up. Good luck with cleaning up yourself. That's like cleaning a fish before you catch it. That can never happen. You have to let Jesus catch you and then he could clean you up. And I saw God clean my dad up so I knew that the power of God was real. Nobody could tell me any differently. But I still struggle with hope. You know, just because my dad was a Baptist didn't make me a Christian. Just because my parents were Christian didn't mean I had a relationship with the Lord. You see, I still had my own story. I still had my own walk with Jesus. And my brother, a guy that I looked up to my whole life. You see, I didn't look up to a Peyton Manning growing up. The guy I looked up to was Sean King, played in my own home. He ended up being 36th pick of the 95 draft. And every day I wanted to be like this guy. And I saw when he was with the coach, his son got sick. His little boy, he was two years old. They rushed him to the hospital. They put him on life support. They were shocking these pallets together to shock his little boy's lifeless body off this hard hospital table. They were pumping air into his lungs to try to get him to breathe again as my brother played with the coach. So my brother, he was this big, tough guy at the moment. He would fight at the drop of a hat, but this time he had no opponent. He had no one to throw his hands up. For six days, the prayer team would come by and tell us about Jesus as my little nephew laid there on their life support. For six days, the prayer, my mom and dad would come by and pray for us and tell us about Jesus. But after six days, they brought my brother a stack of papers. They said, Mr. King, there's nothing else we could do for your son. At best, we're going to have to hell vacuum back into a children's hospital, which was a four-hour drive from where we lived. My brother couldn't get on the helicopter with him. He had to rush home and pack a bag so he could drive to this hospital and try to meet his little boy because he knew he would be there alone. So as my brother rushed home that night, he got in the closet and started packing a bag. My brother was this big, tough guy who played for the Colts. He would have done anything. But this time I heard him at his weakest moments. I heard him crying out to an almighty God that he didn't know. I heard him getting real angry that night in that closet. And the reason he said he got so mad is because he remembered what this world told him. This world told us our whole life that man, if you could just get your hands on some money. My brother had all this money in that closet, but this money couldn't save his son. He said, man, if you'll just trade in, if you'll just buy yourself a lot of nice things, that'll help. He would have traded it all in just to see his son live. So that night he knew it was something bigger than money. You know, he told me that he knew it was something bigger than him because he lost his will to live. He was tired of being this big, strong football player who had to help everybody else fight their battles. 
He was tired of being this big, strong guy who could never cry. He just wanted to be a father to his son. So that night he cried out to an almighty God that he did not know. He said, Jesus, I know you're real, but please be real in my life. He asked him to take this pain out of his chest. And that night he cried out to an almighty God. He gave his heart to Jesus right there in that closet. And I want to tell you how good God is. My brother didn't know if he was going to pick up a body. He didn't know what to expect once he drove to that hospital. And as he walked to the door, the doctors meet him at the door and they said, Mr. King, we know you've had a long drive, but we think we can save your son. Lo and behold, that was the best news he had ever heard in his life. They said it's going to take a while. He's going to have to relearn all of his motor skills again all over at three years old. But we think we can get him out of this hospital. And I want to tell you, because of the goodness of God, my little nephew, he's 16 years old. He's going to be an All-American. You know what? He doesn't think there's a mountain he can't climb because we breathe life into him every day. How many of you know today's kids are tomorrow's future? And how many of you know they're so important to us? Amen. But you know what? I saw God work a miracle in my whole family. But you know what? I still struggle with hope. I was trying to hang on to the material things of the world that it said it takes for me to be successful. I was playing for the Chicago Bears. I got released. I started playing arena football. I moved back home to our neighborhood in West Monroe, Louisiana, where they lifted us up every day and they were behind us when we were in an affair. Now they were talking behind our backs, saying they've blown their only chance. What a waste. And I remember hearing those words, and you know what, I was struggling at the time. And I remember struggling with hope. I was tired of being Jerome King. I was tired of fighting this fight all along. So my buddy invited me to an evangelistic service that night. He said, hey, Jerome, if you'll come to church tonight, man, it'll change your life. And I'd never given anybody a chance to change my life. I always thought that I could change myself. But that night I gave it a chance. That night I was searching for some hope. And as I sat in the back pews, he was speaking on who Jesus is and what he can do in my life. Then he told me how he died this horrible Roman crucifixion so that I could have life for all of eternity. Then he told me how much he loved me. You see, I've been to church my whole life. I didn't know God loved me so much. You know, I watched many pastors stand up there and yell, you're not holy enough. God's going to get you. You're going to hell. And I thought I needed a scorecard, and I had to earn my way to heaven, and my scorecard could never be good enough. But that night he told me that I couldn't earn it. He told me that I didn't deserve it. That night he told me I was saved by grace. And you know what? Grace came upon my life that night. You see, God began to reveal himself to me. You see, the Bible declares that our lives are here with Christ, that if you lose your life to Christ, you'll find your life. Life, but if you try to hang on to it, you're going to lose it. And that night, I gave my life to Christ, and I humbled myself. And the Bible declares that if you will humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hands of God, he will exalt you, or he will lift you up. And that night, I came forward, and I gave my heart to Jesus as I stood there at that altar. But I want to tell you, as I stood there at that altar, the devil started reminding me of the person I used to be. He said, oh, yeah, man, you've come forward tonight. You've given your heart to Jesus. But you know what? You've done some things wrong. You've hurt people. You've lied. You know what? I had a little bit of a history, and I worried, what would people think about Jerome King as I stood there at that altar and I lived my life in condemnation? That's why they say the Word of God will set you free. You see, I started reading the Word of God, and one of my favorite scriptures comes from Romans 8 and 1, and you know what it says? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after flesh, but after the Spirit. And you know what that means this morning? That means there's no judgment on me, because I'm in Christ Jesus, and I'm in the Word of God, and the Bible declares that God redeemed me. That's right, He redeemed me from the curse, and the Bible declares that God purchased me, not with things such as silver and gold, but I was purchased with the precious blood of the Lamb, without a spot or a blame. And the reason for the hope that is in me today is because that night at that altar, God saved me. He set me free. He wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life. And I know no matter what happens from this day forward, God Almighty has my back. Let's give him praise for that. Come on, how many of you know he's the hope to the hopeless? He's the father to the fatherless. Hey, he's a miracle working God and God wants to do a miracle in your life. He's the hope. So would you bow your head and close your eyes? With every head bowed and every eye closed. You know what? Somebody asked me one day, 
How do you get saved? And I want you to understand something. When you get saved, it's your spirit that gets saved. And I see a lot of people have let God save them. But God wants to do more than save you. God wants to own your life. Your will, mind, and emotions. Because when God owns you, then God can fix you. Can I just be honest this morning? We can't fix ourselves. The Bible declared that we're all filthy as rags without Jesus. But when God owns you, then God can fix you. Because what God wants, God gets. What God owns, God redeems. What God owns, God promotes. What God owns, God cleans up. What God owns, God defends. So with every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, would you give God ownership over every area of your life this morning? You know, God wants to own your touchdowns as much as your fumbles. I see a lot of people giving God their touchdown, but God wants to own your fumbles. God wants to own your mess-ups as well as your strengths. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, wouldn't it be good to be sure God is with you this morning? Oh, I know you believe in God. Every good person in Evansville believes in God. I know you grew up in a Christian church. You went to a Christian school. But has there ever been a point in your life where you surrendered your life to an almighty God? Has there ever been a point in your life where you said, Jesus, here I am. You own me, Lord. With every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe you walk through those church doors, you say, Jerome, I'm struggling with hope. I want to be sure God's with me. So if that's you this morning, if you want to be sure God's with you, if you want to settle this score once and for all and know for yourself that if you die today, out of this body until the presence of the Lord you go. If that's you, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to slip your hand up. Not for me and not for the church, but as a sign to God this morning, as a message to God saying, Lord, I'm not ashamed. I want to make a stand for you today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, wouldn't it be good to be sure? Hell's way too long to be wrong. The Bible declared that whosoever calls on his name shall be saved. The Bible declared that whoever calls on Jesus, he will never turn them away. If there's a thousand steps that separate you and Jesus this morning, if you'll just take one of them, the good news is he'll run the other 999. That's the good news of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, wouldn't it be good to be sure? Wouldn't it be good to be sure God's with you? All right, well, I'm almost out of time, but if that's you this morning, if you say, Jesus, here I am, and you want to be sure God's with you, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to slip your hand up. Not for me and not for the church, but as a sign to God, as a message saying, Lord, count me in. I want to be sure this morning. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you, on the count of three, I want you to slip your hand up real quickly. One, two, three. Slip up my pocket quickly. Thank God for all those hands. I see your hands, sir. I see that person in the back. I see that young person's hand. I see your hands, sir. Ma'am, thank God for all those hands. I see your hands, but even better, God sees your hands. Is there anybody else that would say yes to Jesus? Thank God for all those hands. You may put them down. Now, for those who raise your hands, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, a prayer of repentance, a prayer of salvation. But if you didn't raise your hand right now, I'd like you to be in an attitude of prayer and join in and support your new brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. If you can hear my voice in this building tonight, I want you to repeat these words. Everybody say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me. I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, and I thank you for being my Savior. I confess with my mouth, and I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Here I am, Lord, not part of me, but all of me. Here I am, Lord, my mess-ups as well as my strengths. I receive salvation. I receive eternal life. I receive salvation. Here I am, Lord, and from this day forward, I'm a child of God. I'm going to step up. I'm going to speak up. And I'm going to announce, my God is able. Thank you, Lord God, for saving me. In Jesus' name, my name is in the book. Heaven has my mansion built. And I'll see you in heaven. And everybody who loves him says, 
Amen. Come on, church. Let's give yourselves a big round of applause. There were a lot of hands that went up. Hey, heaven's bigger and hell's smaller. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, before I call up pastor, I'm going to do one more thing. In a moment, for those who raise your hands, in a moment, I'm going to ask that you get up out of your seats when I count to three. I'm going to ask that you walk down one of these aisles. And you know the reason I want you to do this? Because I want you to face me. I want to pray a blessing over you. We want to commission angels to go home with you. The Bible declares that if you're willing to confess Jesus before others, he'll announce you to the Father and all the angels in heaven. But if you're ashamed of him, how many of you know he'll have to be ashamed of you? How many of you know this? it takes courage to stand for God? And you know what? I can see a lot of people looking at me saying, there's no way in the world I'm going to get up and I'm going to walk down there. But you know that little voice that you hear in your head this morning? How many of you know that is not of God? And this could be the first time in your life you kicked that devil to the curb and you made a stand for somebody who gave their life for you. You know what the Bible says? God would do it all over again if it was just for one of you. You know, I start thinking about my life, the people I've heard, the decisions I've made. And I wonder how could anybody give their life for Jerome King? But 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone comes to Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone and the new is here. You see, I've made a lot of decisions, a lot of bad choices in my past, but I can't let my past shape my future for the way I live for Christ. You see, the guy that you're standing here today has been crucified with Christ. It is I no longer live, but Christ who lives in me. And every morning I wake up, I thank God for another opportunity to give him ownership over my life, for him to give me divine appointments, and for him to set my way forth so I don't care if you raise your hand this high I don't care if you raise your hand this high I don't care if you're five I don't care if you're 55 but if you said that prayer and you are not ashamed to make a can I just be honest with you this is a small town if you did anything everybody would probably know about it how about let's let everybody know that you made a stand for a king of kings who gave his life for you you know what Jesus said he'd do it all over again if it was just for one of you. So I don't care if you raise your hand this high. I don't care if you raise your hand this high. I don't care if you're eight. I don't care if you're 88. But if you said that prayer and made some kind of commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, right now on the count of three, I want you to get up and we're going to cheer you on. One, two, three. Would you turn that music up? Come on, church. Come on, church. Come on, church. Hey, you should be clapping so hard your hands are hurting. Come on. Come on, church. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hey, if we can clap at a, at a game. How many of you think we can clap when somebody's giving their heart to Jesus? Come on. How many of you know God doesn't want to take away your fun? God wants to take away your pain. Are you tired of the weight of the world? Well, guess what? God wants to make a difference today. Come on, church. Woo. Come on, somebody say thank God. Come on. How many of you know this is a bad morning for the devil? How many of you know the Bible says that all of heaven shout for just one? How many of you know this is a big deal this morning? Is there anybody else? Praise the Lord. You can turn that music off. Pastor, I'm going to have you come up here and pray a blessing over him uh, just real quick. And then he's going to hand the microphone back over to me before we uh, exit. But church, let me give them a big round of applause. Come on. Hey, I'm here today to tell you that today's not the end. It's only the beginning. God has a great plan for your life and what God has for you. He doesn't have for anybody else. And how many of you know that's true? You guys are special and unique. And you know what? This world tells us that the diamond is the most precious item in the world. And there is no coincidence that there's no two diamonds the same here on this earth. But Jesus said that you are more precious than diamonds. And there's not two of you made the same on this earth. How many of you know that's a big deal today? What's your name, little lady? Rachel, you know what, Rachel, it's a chance that I'm going to go out that door and I'm going to forget your name, pretty lady. But God Almighty will never forget your name. He knows how many hairs are on your head. That's how much he loves you, Rachel. And Pastor, I'm going to ask you to pray a blessing over <laughs> I appreciate you doing that. Church, can we stretch this way? Heavenly Father, we thank you for these, uh, these precious ones that said yes to hope. 
Father, we as a congregation, we all say yes to hope, the hope that is in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to gather to, around them and surround them as the family of God. We welcome them, Father, into the loving arms of Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you've called us to walk with you. You've called us to relationship. You've called us to be a part of, uh, of your heavenly family. And Lord, we know that we need people. We need loving arms. We need encouragement. We need strength and we need love. And Lord, we thank you for the hope that is in Christ and the hope that is in a relationship, not only that we have with one another, but the hope we have with you. And I just speak blessing over, uh, over these individuals that responded this morning. I pray, Lord, a transformation. I pray, God, your Holy Spirit would, would continue to uh, do something mighty on the inside of them. Father, thank you that there are greater things that happen in us than happen to us, and that the Holy Spirit is residing on the inside. Lord, we thank you for the mighty work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And Father, I pray that there is a daily surrender, that there is a desire, Father, for your word, for prayer, for fellowship, uh, for church, and for, for serving the Lord. And I just speak blessing, and we give you praise. Father, we thank you. What a wonderful moment in Jesus' mighty name. Everyone said amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Well, church, let's give them one more hand clap today. Amen. How many of you know this is a great thing? Praise the Lord. Well, if you would be seated just for about two more minutes of your time, I just want to uh, shift gears for one second before I hand it back over to Pastor. Uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, uh, everywhere we go, somebody asks us, what are you guys? World strongmen, professional wrestlers, uh, football players, what are you guys? And ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand something. Uh, we're missionaries. We're missionaries to today's public schools where we believe God is most void. And one of our main goals is to go into the schools every single week, every single city. But I want to tell you, it's getting harder and harder. And the reason it's getting so hard is because they're taking God out of everything. Crime is up. School shootings are up. The Ten Commandments are down. You know, a, a little girl mailed us a 380 bullet in the mail said, I was going to kill myself in class, but thanks for coming to my school. You know, we were at a school not too long ago, and a football player pulled a gun out of his pocket, and he gave it to one of the guys, and the coach got the gun, the kid got Jesus, and God got all the glory. But how many of you think that's the way it should be? And I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, everywhere we go, we go into hundreds of schools. But I want to tell you, it's not easy. Because we don't charge the church. We pay our own airfare to every school, every city. In one airfare, in one city, our airfare was $17,000 in one month to reach all the students around the country. But how many of you know you can't put a price on that one person who needs Jesus? Amen? And I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, every school we go to, we pray over that school. We ask God to do a miracle in every young person's life. And I truly believe that God does a miracle in every young person's heart. You know why I believe that? Because every school we go to, we have some young person that says, thanks for what you said. I'm not going to kill myself anymore. Wow. Yeah. We average up to four kids per school that say, I'm not going to cut myself anymore. Yeah. You know what? We got a letter the other day, and her name was Melissa. And Melissa said, Dear John Jacobs, you came to my school, and that morning I cut myself from my shoulder to my wrist. And she said, the reason I cut myself is because my dad called me a stupid idiot each and every day. And she said, that morning when you spoke, you so encouraged me and my two girlfriends that we came back to the church that night and we gave our heart to Jesus. But she said, the next night, my dad came and he gave his heart to Jesus. And she said, it's been a year now and now I'm on the volleyball team. And I was like, watch. And she said, my dad never misses a game and where he only used to put me down and call me name, now he only cheers me on. And you know what she said? At the end of her letter to John Jacobs, who's been doing this for over 30 years, she said, if you ever get tired of going into the schools, just remember the next school you go to will have someone just like me. Now, how many of you understand there are over a million churches in North America and not one pastor can go into the school and hold an assembly? But how many of you think it's a victory when God's made a way for us to go where preachers can't go? How many of you think it's awesome when Holy Ghost men invade the devil's territory? Amen. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? It's sh something happened to shock me, and I'll tell this really quick. We were in West Virginia the other day, and two girls came forward, and you know what they said? They said, thanks for what you said today. Me and my friend, we made a suicide pact, and we were going to cut our wrists and kill ourselves at 3 o'clock. And then she told me something that, very, that really shocked me. She said, my mom showed me how to do it. You don't cut across, you cut down, because she said she wanted me to be sure to finish the job. 
But she said, you know what happened that night? Both those girls and their mom came to the church. They all got saved, and those girls hadn't cut their sails. How many of you know we interrupted the devil's plan? How many of you know God can do that? Amen? And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? In a moment, each and every one of you are going to be passed out an envelope. And we call this the envelope of hope. This is the only way we make it. We don't charge the church. We pay our own airfare to every school in every city. And you know what? Each week we have to believe God for 10 schools just to keep going. There's five members of our team. We have an office staff of three more people. And how many of you understand we don't charge the church, but this is the only way we make it. And in a moment, I'm going to ask each and every person in this building, when you receive this envelope, I'm going to ask that you take it and pray over it. Because you know what? Because you write that check today, guess what? Some young person is going to say, I'm not going to kill myself anymore. You know, because you write that check today, guess what? Some young person is going to say, I'm going to make it now. We were at a school the other day, and the kid said, I'm going to make it now. I said, man, that's awesome. He said, I'm going to make it now. I said, that's awesome. He said, I'm going to make it now. I said, why do you, why you keep saying that? And he said he saw his dad kill his mom and then kill himself, and he overheard the guidance counselor said that he wasn't going to make it. But he said, thanks for what you said. I know I'm going to make it now. Now, how many of you understand if we have a chance to go where preachers can't go, how many of you know we can't miss that chance? Amen. And in a moment, I'm going to have the ushers come pass an envelope to every person here. And you know what? We've been believing that God would speak to this church to sponsor five of those schools. And if we're going to reach those five, budget of five schools, you know what? I've been praying. It cost us $1,000 a school assembly. And for 18 years, John Jacobs had to charge the schools $1,000. That was the only way we could make it. But you know what? He kept having to pass by the schools with the barbed wire fence, the schools that needed the most. How many of you know the same kids keep getting the same help? And you know what? God spoke to John Jacobs. You're doing this the wrong way. This is the greatest mission field in the world today. And let the same people in the church who send the missionaries around the world, let them send you to America's public schools and let the reward come back into their lives, back into their families. And you want to hear something powerful? In over 18 years, we've not charged one school. Now we were in the largest high school of 5,000 down in Miami last year. But you know what's even more powerful? We were in one of the smallest schools, a public school of 72 kids in Montana. How many of you know those kids are just as important as those kids of 5,000? Amen. And in a moment, I'm going to ask the usher to pass out an envelope to each person here. And I've been praying that God would speak to three people who would step out in faith and sponsor a school. You know, in one school, one assembly, we had four school teachers. Each one of them sponsored a school and wrote a check for $1,000, and we couldn't believe it. And you know what, God, we said they don't make enough money. And God spoke to them, don't feel bad for them. That's not my way of getting money from them. That's my way of getting money to them. How many of you are glad nobody's ever been hurt by giving to God? How many of you know whatever you give to God can never be a loss? How many of you know it's always a game? Amen? So in a moment, I'm going to have the ushers come forward and pass out an envelope to here. Every, go ahead and ushers pass out an envelope. You know, I've been praying that God would speak to three heroes to step out in faith, a businessman, a businesswoman, and sponsor a school. Maybe you can't sponsor a whole school, but half a school. You know what? I'm going to ask that you give something that moves you because what moves you moves God. You know, I take my wife and kids to the movies. Sometimes it costs me $5 to get into the movies and $59 for the popcorn. I've never understood that. <laughs> but you know what? I'm going to ask that you give up a night out. Give something that moves you. How many of you understand we can't put a price on these young person? You know what? Because you write that check, some young person is going to say, hey, man, I'm going to make it now. I'm not going to kill myself anymore. I don't know about you, but that feels good to me. You're planting seeds on good ground. So would you hold your envelope in your hand? I just want to make this a holy offering. Would you hold the envelope in your hand? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this price, this opportunity that you've given us today to receive a love offering. Father, I thank you for the faith to give and the faith to receive. I ask that you take this offering and multiply it in Jesus' name. I want everybody to say, Holy Spirit, speak to my heart. What would you have me to give? And you know what? I believe the Holy Spirit speaking a figure to every person here. Lord, I thank you for those three people, those three heroes that are going to step out in faith and sponsor a school. Lord, I thank you for the people who are going to sponsor half a school. Lord, I ask that you take it and multiply it in Jesus' name. And everybody says, if you're making out a check, make it out to Power Force, John Jacobs Power Force. If you're giving by bank card, credit card, any card will work. We do shred these. We are a 501c3 ministry. We will send you a receipt. Uh, if you're giving by cash for Jesus, just place it in the envelope. But how many of you think we can reach those five schools? How many of you think our kids are worth it? Amen. 
Praise the Lord. I'm going to have the ushers uh, give them time to figure it out. I want to encourage you to come out tonight to Abundant Life Church at 6 o'clock. Uh, John Jacobs himself will be there tonight. Uh, come out. It's going to have a great time. And you know what? I don't know the pastor of the church over there, but, you know, we have some, we, we can take an unopened soda can out of the machine, and we started crushing them in our hands. And recently, we started smashing them over our head. Now, we've knocked ourselves out. We've almost, I've cut myself. But we've announced tonight that if we can pack that place out, I was going to take an unopened soda can and crush it over the pastor's head of Abundant Life Church. How many of you, I know Pastor, I know Pastor Jay is glad we're not doing that here tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. No, but uh, ushers, if you could, I want to thank you for giving. Thank you for caring. Thank you for making a difference. Thank you for pulling for these kids. And I want you to remember something when you're placing it in the envelope. Evil wins when good people do nothing. I'll say it again. Evil wins when good people do do nothing. But how many of you know when God's people do something, how many of you know God can do the rest? Amen. Thank you for giving. Thank you for caring. Thank you for making a difference for God. Let's give it up for Jesus. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor. Come out tonight at 6 o'clock. Amen. Amen. Can we give God a hand clap of praise? Hallelujah. All right. Give you an opportunity to give. I gave this way up here, if you text Power Force to 77977, I mean, that's awesome. It's simple, and that's how I, that's how I gave uh, this morning. And so I'll uh, give you a few moments to do that. If you guys can put some music on, praise God, it's been a good day. And it's 12.05. You ought to be happy about that, man. We got a lot done in a very short amount of time. Uh, but, uh, you know, as we do, we fellowship a lot. And so you won't beat the Baptist to the buffet. It just won't happen. You know that. They're already there. Praise the Lord, I'm just teasing, man. You know, amen. Hallelujah. God is good. All the time. Oh, hallelujah. Are you, amen. Amen. I don't have anything left to say, man. I could sing a song or do a dance or, amen. No, no, I'm not going to preach this morning. But I am excited uh, for next Sunday. I've got a word for you. We're going to continue our influence uh, series. And Wednesday night, I want as many people that can come Wednesday night, we're having the citywide church prayer service here at Oak Hill Christian Center at 6.30. And so uh, I want you to come. It's going to be more than, just, uh, more than just a regular Wednesday night service, although we don't have a regular Wednesday night service. They're all amazing. I'm excited to get back to Pastor Sam's series on what's next, learn to be disciple makers. Amen. How many know it's incredibly important to know the basics so you can make disciples? Amen. <laughs> And so uh, that'll be in a couple of weeks. The next two weeks, we're in our fast. So we're doing midweek uh, uh, fasting and prayer and doing citywide uh, prayer services. And next Sunday, it's going to be awesome. We're going to be promo and men's ministry and talking to you about the future of men's ministry and uh, some great things going on Monday night, man. So good to have you all. Amen. Let's stand together. I know you're finishing up. And I want to release you. I want to pray a blessing, and, uh, and we're going to get done with this. Amen. And if you guys want to come up and see these guys. Well, hey, Jerome, are you willing to, uh, he's talking. Hey, Jerome, are you, are you guys willing to sign some of these broken bats for the kids? So if you want a broken bat, you might just have to come up here and see them. Amen. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for those that gave their life to you. Thank you that you've renewed hope in us. We love you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. So many things going on today, but if you can get out there tonight at 6 o'clock, it would be awesome. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hug somebody you don't know. Shake their hand. Welcome them to the house of God. We'll see you 6.30 Wednesday night. Amen.